Cyberpunk, the counterculture of the electronic age. I think what cyberpunk is most useful for describing these days is a particular part of the spectrum of pop styles. We believe what we're doing is right. In some cases, um, the law and ourselves might come into conflict, but we believe that morally, we are, we are always in the right, and so we refuse to live like fugitives. Please welcome Ed the Sock. What I always say, folks, you don't have anything good to say, say it often. I've never heard of the word cyber plant before. Cyberpunk's a game, isn't it? Holy cow. Is it, is it a form of music? Tiger? I don't know. Some news or punk? Take a look at this, boys. Unbelievable. Cyber, to me, sounds more like computer. I guess, a, is punk related to the average punk today? I don't know. <laughs> Someone that dresses up like a cyborg or something like that? Someone who is kind of a rebel and embraces technology using computers and virtual reality. The word cyberpunk may not be familiar to everybody. Um, it has come up from a style of literature founded by William Gibson, Canadian science fiction author, and has sort of in manifested itself in people who play with technology. Well, I can actually remember coining the word cyberspace. I wanted like a new term to describe this thing that, that I had come up with in this story, and I wanted something that was really catchy. So I can remember sitting there at the typewriter going, info space, no, data space, no, what are we gonna call it, cyberspace. Mm, no, mm, mm, oh well, and putting it in. Cyberpunk initially was a journalistic, it, it was a label, it was a label that was created to describe the kind of writing I was doing and the kind of writing that some writers I was associated with early on were doing in pretty much the early 80s. The punk computer connection wouldn't have been apparent in 1977 because in 1977 nobody had a PC. I mean, we've forgotten. I mean, it's really hard to keep in mind how recent this technology is. I think where I got the idea to link those things up in my fiction was from talking to people who were very, very into computers, who were really classic nerds as well, and not at all, not at all punks. What's been subsequently very bizarre and kind of amazing and even scary is watching a real subculture evolve. As the 60s movement was counter technology, we are pro technology. We are using technology for our advantage and benefit. A cyberpunk is definitely anarchist, I would say. I know, I know. Actually, no. Why don't we stay here? Go A30. In the cyberpunk, genre or in the cyberpunk universe there is just more than the punk you don't have to look very long at me to probably imagine i'm not uh, in the normal tradition of cyberpunk uh, generation but i spend at least three or four hours a day at a computer seven days a week no of course i need a password mm. I'm not a hired console cowboy who's out there hacking into Sony's computers for some latest uh, uh, designs for a new chip that I'm going to sell to Matsushita. I mean, I'm looking for information that I'm interested in. 
Now, this, this magazine used to be called Reality Hackers, and it was a lot less glossy than it is now. This is probably the high fashion cyberpunk magazine. And some of these articles really do approach cultural theory in you know, a fairly academic sense, but with a, a good kind of a, you know, not exactly street smart, but wise ass attitude. On the other end of the scale, you know, you might see an ad for a magazine called Boing Boing. Now, these, these guys advertise themselves as the perpetual novel, novelty brain jack, which I just think is hilarious. Um, they're into technology at a grassroots level, stuff that you can build yourself out of old discarded um, Apple II computers, you know, that you might find on the junk heap at a school type of thing. Um, and they're very, very tech-oriented. In the middle, you get this mag called Wired, which is a really nice mix between the fashion, the do-it-yourself, homebrew, techno. You know, I'm pretty technical, and so I like to know why things work. I mean, here's a thing that exists as a complete multimedia magazine on a, in a dual CD-ROM um, package. A lot of this kind of uh, understanding that technology had come a long way came from, at first, reading about it through cyberpunk novels like William Gibson, and then actually reading about it in magazines like Monday 2000 and Boing Boing and a lot of other handouts. This album took 10 months, the other two took eight years. I have what I think is uh, I call techno-estrogen, and I, I love the technology because I see it as empowering. And I see the computer not only as an intelligence amplifier, but an enlightenment machine. And I, one of my goals is to help other women see that and, and get to that point. And I hope we'll feel that um, attitude also. What's happening is you've got people who have meat and flesh friends and you have electronic friends, people you talk to every day but you never meet them. They could be on the other side of a planet. They're just at the end of a wire, okay? But, you know, the things you say with them are, are just as realistic as something you'd say to someone who's with you. And this is sort of an expanding subculture of net people. Uh, recently I, I went to Hanover, Germany where there's the world's largest computer show called CBIT. And about 600,000 people go to this computer show. And I, I went over there just to, to learn a bit more about what's happening with, with computers. Sure. So it's about music and about lifestyle and about poetry and about clothes, most of all about music at the moment. And that's where I met James when he announced to go to Berlin and asked where to go. Well, he went to much a lot of places, but um, yeah, I replied to him via email. So how many people around the world use the internet, would you say? How many people? Oh, God. A couple of million, at least. Once you're on a network, no one knows who you are, what you look like, whether you have three arms or none. It's your ideas and what you say that count. And that's it for Cyberpunk Dinner Theater for the spring semester. Um, see you in the summer. Later. Bye. The name is Cyberpunk Research Laboratories, and their research involves being able to bring speakers on who are knowledge speakers in who are knowledgeable in in a range of uh, areas that would be of interest to the students, so develop the students' learning and provide the resources for individual student research. I don't believe that they see this as just fun and just an idle pastime. Um, I think one of their main goals is to really hone their skills so that they will be able to leave 
Seneca College and, and get a, a job that is really useful and productive. They've coined a new way of written expression. We can dub it cyberese because it's, it's English written in uh, a different form. Um, and yes, it, it has errors, but it has intentional um, breakaway. It has a lot of intentional breakaway from standard English. Not for the man, not for the government, not for, for corporations. Hacker or not, whether you have the ability to get the information or not, you have the right to it. We're going to take the information. Yeah. We want it. Nobody understands the issue of privacy in cyberspace, and the cyberpunk attitude is one who says, damn the consequences, I'm just going to go in there and get the information that I want. The easiest do is to hack in and get calling cards so that you can make all these long distance calls with your modem for free. Cyberpunk is, is a, it's like a, a term that I've never been comfortable with because I've been in a unique position to see the sort of hollowness of it. It's sort of like a media construct. It started popping up, I think first in, in a New York Times headline, as a description, it's a, as a synonym for outlaw hackers. This is a, our, our complete manual to ESS phone switching system. Most invaluable oh, yeah. guide to any phone freak. A lot of hackers um, like to live as, as, as if they're criminals. They change their alias weekly or monthly or bi-monthly. And they'll, you know, that they're never, they're careful never to give out too much information. But we're not like that. We believe what we're doing is right. In some cases, um, the law and ourselves might come into conflict, but we believe that morally we are, we are always in the right, and so we refuse to live like fugitives. What hackers are doing is often no more than the electronic equivalent of getting into the air conditioning ducts and crawling for miles and miles. They don't get anything out of it, but they do it anyway. Somebody else with different motivation could use those same air conditioning ducts to rob a bank or steal medical records or do something do something fairly heavy and the the real potential for mischief in cyberspace is a very very scary thing in the united states someone rewrote it 911 to a phone line that they were intercepting and so people were calling up 911 and they're saying, they're saying yeah or they're saying you know help I'm uh, I'm being attacked and the people say oh well that's kind of a bummer isn't it mm. you know and that's that's irresponsible use and that's these these people do exist <clears throat> just like you know mm. cars exist and 99% of the people use their car responsibly mm. but there's that one person who doesn't use it responsibly it's the same with knowledge it's the same with everything in life yeah. uh. I think Bell Canada would have to thank us for uh, revealing a flaw they have in their um, their ANI system. Yeah. Um, uh, ANI is a know. method by which um, Bell can tell what number you're calling from. We could have spent the rest of our life fooling Bell Canada, but we published it in the magazine, and security personnel read it, and it's they fixed gone. it. Now it's gone. Uh, All right, no problem. Around. And now it's our challenge to find another hole in their system and their challenge to keep their system impenetrable. Yeah. And this is what really starts you into it, mm -hmm. into the into the phone freaking and the yeah. the hacking, etc. Is this all there is? But then you no. make you a random yeah. call and maybe you'll hear a modem signal coming over. Yeah. You've misdialed or something. It's like, hey, you know, I could I, I could have touched my modem up here and probably connect here. Maybe this is a bulletin board. Yeah. But like, oh no, this isn't a bulletin board. Oh, this no, is saying it's the Ministry it's of saying, Finance. It's, or oh. it's yeah, it's saying private yeah. keep out. Well yeah. why <laughs> why why why, 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 why can't I come in? Yeah, why doesn't the Ministry of Finance have a want me to know what they're doing? You know, yeah. and I'm not going to get in that instant. I have no idea what I'm doing, but there are other people, and eventually I run know. into them, and exactly. they, they can... Know. And they help you. Yeah. They help you learn, yeah. and you get in, and, and then in turn, find out what you want to know. And yeah. a few yeah. years that's, later, that's we're helping thing. other people learn. Yeah. Hacking a system doesn't have to be sitting away at a keyboard for 10 hours. No. It could It could all take place in a phone call in which you're manipulating and someone yeah, into exactly. giving you information. If you're good at convincing people that you are in fact someone else, 
I'm a little confused. We've moved recently. We've had a little mix-up before with the bills. To, to what address are you sending the, uh, the bills to? 16... Sixteen Lake Shore. Hackers come in waves, okay? okay? Every it used to be maybe every two years there'd be a new wave of maybe twenty or thirty people. Yeah, so, I'm gonna be a hacker, you know, I'm gonna learn this, right? Yeah. And as from our perspective, we see these waves coming out more and more frequently, mm -hmm. and there are more people in them, and it's getting so that the scene is just building up and building up and building up. The people who are bringing you today's computers are yesterday's, are yesterday's hackers. You know, if, they, if they'd been caught, they'd have never got their job in the computer because in the computer yeah. industry because they'd say, no, we don't want hackers. Oh, press return. Do it again. Right. Okay. Yeah? 477 You know, when the police became aware of this, you know, when the, when the FBI and, and the establishment became aware of these kids, they had, a lot of they had a lot of trouble coping with it. They just sort of threw them in jail. And so some of the ones who were like on the, uh, the absolute, you know, nasty list for the cops five or six years ago are now guys sitting in offices, and, uh, you know, offering, offering quite legitimate security services. There's always going to be somebody who knows more about it than you do because there's, there's always new territory. So you, the edge, these, ki these kids can always, in effect, move the outhouse because the, the, peop the authorities may not know that there is an outhouse to move. The real trend with computers over, over the next 50 years will be that they'll simply become invisible and we'll forget that we have them. How do the pupil operate your brain? Open your eyeball. Cyberpunk. <laughs> I mean, I think cyberpunk is a little, it's a little passe. computer will introduce Macintosh and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. For you. What do you get when you cross a community cable station with a tacky set, a cigar sock, and his gel-laden straight man? Well, a show with a cult following of about 60,000 people is what you get. Put on your dancing shoes. It's time for Ed's Night Party. Hello, Ed, and I can't believe I'm here. That's a lovely jacket. Oh. Last time I saw something like that, I was holding coffee beans. Well, I can't believe I'm doing this story. I cannot believe that my producer actually convinced me to do a story on a sock. Ah, Hi. Stephen, the illustrious producer. Should I be shielding my face during this? I, I, I don't think know. so. I you think always so. follow this closely? I do. Okay, we hardly this know each other. This is your set. This is our set. This Notice the lovely upholstery on the couch. This is really tacky. Why have you got a sock hosting a, a late night talk show? 
Well, I guess when you consider the other people hosting shows, you'd rather have a puppet than a dummy. Put a bum. Yeah. Um, I think because the, the challenge now is to make programs that are different and that are immediately visually arresting because people are channel surfing all the time. When they go by and they see a green-haired sock puppet with a cigar talking and a gravelly they voice, stop. they're going to stop. Now, you worked with Heather Locklear. Yeah. You with also Heather. worked with Michelle Pfeiffer. Yes, I did. How do you get mm. these gigs? Well, Ed, it's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. Believe Can me, I'm good at doing dirty jobs. Do you have a name of an agent? <laughs> No, I don't. Okay. Wait a minute. You you actually have scripts? The show sure. has a script? Well, about 15% of it is scripted, I'd say. Well, this is the first script I've actually ever seen. So. That's okay. So we were, we were trying to clean ourselves up for you, but... Sort of uh, made it look as if... Mostly it's uh, just shopping lists there. It's not for real. But uh, there, what was the line that you were... Hello, uh, Ed. Is that, or hello, Ed, hello, everyone? Or should it be hello, everyone, hello, Ed? When we start... Are you becoming show? a method actor? Is that what this is... I saw a Brady Bunch episode like that. He's testing his voice. I have a question for you. What's that? You were in that show, The Man from Uncle. Right. Still a rerun, still a popular show. Why didn't they call it The Men from Uncle? There was you and the other guy, Kuryakin. Well, originally there was only me, and then the, the other guy got added, so they didn't want to change the title. That's so did you guys take turns being The Man from Uncle? No, one we... week it was him, one week it was you. No, we were both uh, Men from Uncle each week. One thing that amazes me is that you actually get some of the guests that you do coming onto the show, people like Robert Vaughn, uh, when they must be fully aware they're just going to get lambasted by the sock. I suspect sometimes the agent doesn't tell them. And uh, really, when you consider the fact that Love Boat and Fantasy Island are off the air, where do these guys have to go? There's dinner theater. That's true. And there's Ed's Night Party. And I think it's actually those two in succession. It's, it, those are used as a gauge as to when you should get out of the business. Right on. Let's please welcome Ed O the Magnificent. Greetings, everybody. Hello. Tim Salabim. I am Edo the Magnificent. You are magnificent. Edo the Magnificent. Look at that outfit. What kind of jewel you is like this? What kind of jewel is that? That's a, Don't touch it. It's sir. worth a lot of money. I, I know. This is this week's letters. People's... This week's letters? This week's Get letters. out of here. Uh, I like the show for two reasons. The attractive young ladies and their shapely legs. Um, the other one we won't get into. Don't let them take you off the air. Ed is God. A lot of that. The recurring theme is Ed is God. What do you got in your hair? It's called a pomade. They call oh, a it. pomade. Um, not palm, but palm, P-O-M. A pomade, and what the hell is that? Well, it's like a relaxer. You put it in your hair, it makes your hair uh, uh, limp and... Uh, oh, it makes your hair limp, eh? Greasy. Makes your hair limp? Yeah. I understand you've been rubbing that in other parts of your body. Uh, Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Listen, I just want to say thanks a lot for granting me this interview. I really appreciate you taking the time. That's fine. Just remember to sign the check. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the real reason I'm here is I'm going to reveal the identity of the person who's behind you. Pardon me? Uh, Sorry, ma'am. Wait a minute. Where do you guys get off? What's with these guys? What it's are the you the 90s. Nuts? you got to have protection. Yeah! I can't stand it! Now, Steve, I'm sure that you would like to think that Ed would give Dave Letterman a run for his money, but where do you see the show going realistically? Well, realistically, the sky's the limit. People uh, tend to like very alternative programs nowadays, and uh, that's what all the uh, cable in the States has been built on. You never know where he could go. I never really thought in the beginning, though in the back of my mind I did, I never thought realistically that he could go as far as he's gotten already. After all, you're here.